Well, we are continuing our summer sermon series on the Beatitudes, looking at each of the blessings or each of the Beatitudes that Jesus delivers during his famous Sermon on the Mount, when he is along a mountainside by the Sea of Galilee, a place that many were able to visit during our recent trip to the Holy Land. And this morning we'll be looking at Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 5. One verse. If you'd like to follow along for that one verse, you certainly could. It's on page 4 of the New Testament section of your Red Pew Bible. The words of Jesus to his disciples and the crowds that have gathered along by the mountainside. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Gracious God, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that are open to receive and respond to your word, your message to us this morning. Amen. All right, show of hands. How many have seen the movie Monty Python's Life of Brian? Okay. How many have seen it, but you didn't want to raise your hand because you're in church? All right. I love, I'm a big Monty Python fan, and if you haven't seen this particular movie, how should I say this? I am not recommending that you watch it, but if you happen to watch it, let me know, and we can share a few laughs. So released in 1979, the film tells the story of Brian Cohen, a young Jewish Roman man who was born on the very same day and next door to Jesus. And Brian ends up being uh, mistaken as the Messiah. It's, it's a really funny satire movie. Maybe not for the younger ones in the audience. But one of my favorite scenes is when Jesus is on the mountainside delivering his Sermon on the Mount. And you kind of hear the words of Jesus going through all the Beatitudes, sort of off in the distance. But the focal point of this scene is the crowd. And like any crowd, some are really trying to focus, some are distracted. There's a couple people that are getting into sort of arguments, about to have fistfights. You know, it's, it's kind of typical. It's probably what the crowd would have been like. And this particular crowd uh, is sort of in the back. Like they didn't get the front row seats. So they're having a hard time hearing this rabbi who's clearly very popular. And, you know, they want to kind of hear what this rabbi Jesus is saying. And again, it's kind of coming in and out. It's a brilliantly filmed scene. And I'm kind of doing a little narration for you here. What was that? Well, I I think it was blessed to the cheesemakers. Like, oh, what's so special about cheesemakers? Well, obviously, this is not meant to be taken literally. It refers to any manufacturer of dairy products. Hmm. Did you hear that? What? Blessed are the Greek? The Greek? Hmm, well, apparently he's going to inherit to the earth. Did anyone catch his name? Oh, it's the meek. Blessed are the meek. Oh, well, that's very nice, isn't it? I'm glad they're getting something because they've had a hell of a time. (laughs) It's a great scene. But the question, of course, is who are the meek? And why are they blessed? Because clearly, in that day, and in our day, the meek are not necessarily a category that you would think of when you think of God's blessings and those who will inherit the land or inherit the earth. So who or what are the meek, and why does Jesus say they are blessed? Now, for context, the Sermon on the Mount makes far more sense uh, to Galilean peasants in the first century than it probably did to Monty Python's crew, or to us today. It makes more sense to refugees fleeing violence, to hungry children who know the raw ache of an empty stomach, than to those of us who live with more privilege than not. The Beatitudes make more sense to those who are struggling to pay rent, or those who are forced into labor, those back then who had no land of their own, than to us who have property, and sometimes multiple properties. The Sermon on the Mount made more sense to that context 
then perhaps at initial look when we read those words. Because Jesus speaks directly to those who suffer, and it's to those who suffer that he's making these promises because they were in need of hope and good news. And Jesus came bearing good news. Jesus was good news. Now, in Jesus' time, we we know about the tax collectors, and we've talked about that. The people did not like the tax collectors. I don't know if anyone likes tax collectors, right? Well, tax collectors back then, no one liked, which is why when one of the tax collectors became a disciple, that was a big deal. But there's probably no more hated class back then than landowners, even more than tax collectors. Especially within the Roman Empire, who was the sovereign in that area at that time, many landowners acquired the land through coercion, bribery, violence, abuse of power, or just brute force. They wanted something and they took it. And that was the way of the world. That's how things operated during Jesus' time. And perhaps landowners and people in that category were there listening to Jesus, but certainly we know because of Jesus' ministry, he was preaching to fishermen, to farmers, to the rural poor. That was, was you know, the group that he called to be his disciples and those who gathered wherever Jesus was teaching, wherever Jesus was healing, wherever Jesus was feeding, because they had need of all of those things. So that is the audience And they're hearing these words. They know about land. They don't think they're going to inherit any. And they hear these words, blessed are the meek, you, who sometimes get trampled upon. God is with you. You are blessed. You will inherit the earth. See, back then, That was the way that the world worked, and it still kind of works that way now. That was the way that the world worked, and many suffered at the hands of it. The meek in the Roman kingdom did not possess land. But they were the ones that Jesus called blessed. So let's take a step back and look at that word blessed for a moment and compare it to another word. Neurochemistry, brain studies, and the ever-present consumer sciences have tried to describe and prescribe a sort of anatomy of happiness. Algorithms determine which ads pop up on your web browser or Facebook page. Have any of you noticed that? Like, How do they do that? Well, they're trying to appeal to your daily happiness quota. It's all about marketing, trying to see images, or convince us to buy things that will make us happy. And we all want to be happy. We think we should be happy. And then we're often shocked to find out that what we want does not make us happy all the time. Shocking, right? We work so hard and we take all these different means to acquire, accumulate. Generally, it's more stuff, usually, Sometimes it's power or reputation. We grasp at it thinking, if I can only get that, if I can only climb that corporate ladder, then I will be happy. And then we're not. Because perhaps we've confused the real definition and what we're seeking and what really will bring us more contentment or blessedness. So Jesus begins these teachings, see, not with a promise of happiness, as sort of our culture seems to define it, but with promises of blessedness, even and perhaps most in hard human experiences. Experiences of mourning and sadness and meekness and peacemaking and persecution and poverty of spirit. Jesus is saying it's precisely in those situations where we can find true blessedness. So in the opening verses of Matthew 5, he talks about blessed. Now, it's a tough word to get at in the English language and in the American culture because the blessed are not the happy, at least not in Jesus' eyes, or certainly not in the sense of the consumer culture 
that describes pleasure. If we try to equate the two, that's not what Jesus was getting at. The Greek word here that's used is makarios. So it has a range that includes fortunate, special, privileged, and it can include happy. Happiness and blessedness may overlap, but they're not identical. They're more like, well, they function like fraternal twins, right? And if you have fraternal twins, they can get along really well sometimes, and other times they are constant enemies, and you think, are they, too, are they even related to one another, right? Well, being blessed and being happy sometimes function the same way. Because you can be blessed and have a sense of God's blessings on your life, but you might not feel happy. In fact, those situations Jesus is describing, I wouldn't consider happy contexts. When you're mourning, you're not really happy. When you're striving for peace, trying to make reconciliation, when you're poor in spirit, if you are counted among the meek, you may not have feelings of happiness, but you are blessed. Jesus' forms of blessedness only make sense in light of the kingdom of God. You have the kingdom of the Roman Empire, and Jesus is holding up a whole different reality, a whole other way of seeing the world, of seeing yourself and seeing your circumstances, of believing in yourself. The world might be telling you one thing about you and who you are, and God is telling you something different. And so Jesus is lifting up the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Jesus said in his presence, the kingdom of heaven has come among you now. So it's not something that you have to wait for some other time or after you die. That's part of the promise. But Jesus says it is here among you now. Jesus is ushering in a new reality. And for so many people, they needed to hear those words. We need to hear those words. Because we look out there and we think, if this is all that there is, if there's no other way, it's a little depressing. Maybe not just a little, a lot. But Jesus says, no, no, there is another way. There is a different reality. Within God's life, God's reign, God's kingdom, blessedness does not depend on wealth or health or status It's not a reward for righteousness or your duty. Rather, blessedness is God's sheer gift. It's God's grace upon each and every one of us. And especially at times and for those who are going through difficulties. Because the reality is that's when we need God's grace all the more. When we think we have it all together... Sometimes we think, God, I don't really need any help. I'm good. Of course, the reality is you're not. (laughs) We're not. But when we're at our end, when we are understanding we need help, that's when God says, you are. I'm here. Grace and abundance, blessings are yours. So sometimes, as Jesus indicated, and maybe as you have experienced, times of mourning, Times of being maybe in poverty or certainly poverty of spirit when you just feel like you've got nothing left to give to life. Times of meekness, those can reveal the inbreaking of God's abundant life. See, in today's world, it seems to be that the aggressive and the self-promoting are the ones who get ahead, right? You don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate, That's kind of the the phrase, right? Might makes right. In the workplace, often, it's the, the arrogant and the powerful seem to win. But ultimately, they lose. As the psalm that Val read said, their life is like grass. It's going to fade and not last. And they certainly don't win in personal relationships. I mean, no one wants an arrogant, passive-aggressive, self-seeking friend, right? They might be able to climb certain ladders, but in interpersonal relationships, and that's really what it's about. Nor do they win, really, in financial security 
because the more money they have, the less financially secure they feel. See, people like that, they think they possess the world, but the world possesses them. And that's not a place you want to be in, as Jesus says. The meek, on the other hand, they understand that this world is not ours to grasp or to claim ownership of. Rather, this world and all who are in it is ours to steward. It's all God's. It's all God's gift. In fact, the meek have contemplated what it means to live in a way that affirms the value and the integrity and the life of all those living and breathing creatures with which we inhabit and share this world. The meek do not seek to dominate creation, but to be caretakers of it. The meek are gentle. Yes, they are gentle. They're gentle in their footprints on the planet Earth. And they understand the responsibility to be good stewards of all that is given, all that is entrusted to us in righteousness in fairness, in equity, and justice. So Jesus knew that the meek, though they may struggle in this life, are ultimately the ones who will succeed because they are grounded. They're understanding the values and the priorities of God's kingdom. And, unlike their counterparts, They have a healthy and more honest definition of success. Just yesterday, in this very sanctuary, we welcomed over 230 guests to celebrate the marriage of Timothy O'Connor and Kaylee Hunt. I had the privilege of getting to know this couple over the last 18 months, spending a significant amount of time with them on Zoom and phone calls and in person wonderful couple, and we celebrated their their love. Now, over the past two years, Tim, a man in his 30s, lost his father and one of his older brothers. He has gone through more suffering than most people at that age should ever have to go through. And part of the wedding ceremony, there was a dedication and remembrance of Tim's older brother, Noel, and his dad, Brendan O'Connor. And one of his aunts read a poem. And this poem used to hang in a special place in Noel's apartment. Noel was considered by all who knew and loved him a meek person, but a person of great strength and inner perseverance and beauty. And so I'm going to read this poem. And we think about the definitions of the powerful and the mighty and how they define success and really what true success is and that if this is the definition of it if this is what we are striving for then all is ours the meek will inherit the earth success by ralph waldo emerson to laugh often and much to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child or a garden patch, to know even one life has breathed easier because you lived. This is to be a success.